Okay, uh, everyone, welcome to the Winkies and AI panel. Uh, this is really exciting. Um, uh, feels like a real Silicon Valley panel. I don't know if it's the the, the people or the uh, or the subject matter. Cultures. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the attire. Um, so um, yeah, let's just get started. We're talking about Winkies and artificial intelligence, which is obviously obviously a, a huge topic. Uh, in any context, and, and it's been a big topic today. Um, maybe all of you can just, uh, I guess, starting with Jeffrey, you could go, uh, please introduce yourselves. Yeah, so my name is Jeffrey Wong. Um, I am a software engineer at Microsoft, and I'm also uh, the founder of MyWikis. So I have two different kinds of approaches uh, today in the panel. Um, so as you saw today in our talks earlier, we saw um, ways that we could use uh, AI to, you know, either even generate uh, wiki text or at least to search it through a question answering bot. Um, and then at Microsoft, we make extensive use of open AI technologies such as um, chat GPT, um, other GPT kinds of models. And uh, we have a really exciting, you know, um, uh, I guess, uh, front row seats to that. So I'd love to share those with you today. And in addition, another member of who was supposed to be on the panel today was not able to make it in person, but I'll be filling in for him um, through my phone. Uh, Gunjin, who presented earlier um, in the morning today, um, he will be monitoring your questions as well, and he'll be responding through me. Very good. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Nadrovsky. I'm the uh, Director of Engineering for the Platform Engineering Team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, <clears throat> software engineer of many years and, and loved uh, loved all of that, and now I have the privilege of working uh, on MediaWiki in addition to many other things for the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, in being able to participate in things like our annual planning processes and working on deciding, you know, how we can best serve the community and the world at large and the future of free knowledge everywhere. Um, obviously, things like ChatGPT, generative AI content, other things like that, sort of are something being added to the game that we need to decide. How do we best support? How do we best enable? How do we best change and move forward um, with these changing times to enable our communities of editors, of contributors, of readers, and everything else across the world? So happy to share any perspectives I can on that front. Uh, hey, folks. I'm Lane Becker. I'm also with the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I head up Wikimedia Enterprise, which is our sort of for-profit service that does a form of data sales around Wikimedia contents uh, to third parties who want to reuse it. Um, I spoke last year uh, at this conference, so I met some of you there. And so I'm happy to give sort of a broad overview of what it is that we do. But in the context of this conversation, I can say that like as a person who probably spends more time thinking about third party data reuse in the sort of Wikimedia uh, environment, um, uh, and also is one of the people that's sort of actively tasked with thinking about like what sort of business models and business opportunities are on that. We look at what's happening with the AI landscape and and uh, how it's affecting our, you know, we've only been around for three years, but even now it's sort of having a sea change effect on the business and the way that we think about data reuse in third party environments. And we have a lot of sort of big, almost existential questions that we're trying to answer around that. So I'm hopeful that I can talk about some of that here today. And uh, and we'll see what use, we'll see we'll see of what use it is. Um, I also need to apologize if the panel ends up running past three o'clock, as some of these folks here know. I have to take off and go. I live here in town. I got to go pick up my daughter from her school. <laughs> so if we run late, that's awesome. But I'm have to pull. <laughs> Just apologizing in advance. Okay. Well, we'll get right to it. So yeah, I have a, I have a bunch of questions. I'm sure people in the audience do, but I figured I would give uh, AI the first crack at the question at a question. So. Uh, I asked, uh, I went to Bing AI uh, this morning. I, asked it, I said, I will be moderating a conference talk on wikis and AI. What are five questions I should ask the panelists? Um, I, was, I wasn't that impressed with the answers, but uh, I thought the best, one, best of them was, um, how can AI be used to improve the quality of wiki content? So, uh, so Lane, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I find the sort of concept of the, the human in the loop piece of this work just so like so interesting and empowering. One of the places that we, um, and I will say this doesn't really like touch on you know the the business of Wikimedia Enterprise is just that like we are very at the end of the funnel 
You know what I mean? Like all of the other, all of the actual hard work has been done and the content's been generated and managed and maintained and we're just sort of like sluicing it off and sending it forward. Um, that said, you know, when I'm talking to like third party customers, let's say big search engines, you've probably heard of slash worked at some of them. Um, uh, you know, we get, we often get like sort of two sets of questions on the team, right? Like one is how can we, how, how, you know, how can you improve the delivery of the content that you have? And then the other is like, how can you improve the content itself? And I'm like, we were spending a lot of time on that first question about improving delivery and making it more useful, more machine readable, more reliable. Uh, and we both do not and cannot spend any time whatsoever on uh, on the question of content itself, right? That's very much outside the foundation's purview. That said, like I am so intrigued by this idea of different types of tools that can be used. I mean, obviously there's a lot of use of AI already, for example, managing our sort of misinformation and disinformation. Matt can speak to that much more effectively than me. But this idea of being able to use tools to improve content generation, content management, content maintenance, I feel like it's just it's a wide it's a wide open space. Obviously, the community that builds the content has to get, or communities, I should say, that actually make the content have to determine and sort of increasingly, um, uh, they have to determine their level of comfort with these types of tools. But I think, and this is where I'll pass it off to Matt, I think the opportunity mm -hmm. to start to think about how to build those in ways that are supportive of human generation of information are so interesting and so ripe for opportunity in this space. Yeah, I, I think those are great points, Lane. Um, to sort of you know, add to that too. I think that, you know, one thing an AI can never do, I mean, is, is look out the window and observe a context of what's happening in the same way that a human would. Sure, it might be able to observe objects that are outside that room. It might be able to make inferences about the organization of those objects or things like that. But the human experience and the context of the human experience of those things, that's special to us. Uh, and so I think when you think about, you know, how content is either made better or created. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to use uh, generative AI uh, tools to help create that content. There's opportunity to develop tools and plugins and extensions for things like MediaWiki that might be able to leverage, you know, ChatGPT or other tools to, to take a look at content on existing pages and maybe find additional references or use, you know, pattern matching or other things like that to understand um, maybe some potential gaps in articles or raise some information up that could help augment articles. All that stuff's great. I don't see, I don't see, um, I guess I see augmentation of that. I don't see a replacement of that. So there's no, to, to Lane's point about the human centric focus part, like that is so fundamental to what we all do and the context coming from humans and the creativity coming from humans uh, is really, really important. So as we all start to, and even we start to plan like what we want to do in the coming year and the year after that, the next three years, I think it's really important um, to think about what types of tools could make our editor experience better. What types of tools would we need to build within MediaWiki if there is a swath of AI generated content coming in um, that would help us to identify relevance? Because sometimes these AI tools are very confident in the way that they write these things. And sometimes the sources that they cite are non-existent. And sometimes, so I think it's going to be a lot of exception handling. And to not make that an undue burden on the, the amazing humans across the world that help make tools like Wikipedia and others successful, we have to be pretty thoughtful about building some things to help put guardrails around that. We're not going to stop it. It's going to happen, but we have to build some guardrails. So that's, I guess, where my mind goes. It's happening. How do we make it beneficial and how do we build guardrails around it? Yeah, so this the answer I'm about to give is a combination of my thoughts and Gunjan's thoughts. Um, so first, my thoughts are, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I agree that we can't really replace that human aspect of it, right? Because as Gunjan mentioned in his presentation earlier today, the content that AIs generate, it's all from Wikipedia. Well, not all of them, but a lot of it is from there. So it'd be, it'd be a paradox to try to have Wikipedia write its own content. That doesn't sound right to me at all. At all. Um, so we have to be careful with how to do so. Now, with specifics on how we can use AI specifically to, what are some examples we could use it for? One easy way to do it would just be to fix the grammar in articles. That's objective, right? Um, and you can fix that if the AI is producing wrong information, you can also detect that. Um, another thing is you could generate some text based on a summary, right? 
Um, so it's kind of the opposite of summarization. It's like expanding upon that with existing information that the model already knows. Um, detecting misinformation, including even detecting if a um, if an article was generated by GPT, you can actually use GPT to detect that itself, which is very interesting. Um, but yeah, you can slightly change up a generative model to detect whether that generated content came from that specific model or not. Um, and I think OpenAI can do it because they have the model weights. Maybe it's a little bit difficult for other models to do so, but it's certainly possible. Cool, very good. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, when we talk about wikis and AI, I want to uh, mention before, I mean, we're really talking about two or two and a half different <laughs> subjects. One is using AI to, to bring in content, uh, and the other is using it to extract content. Uh, where content can be, of course, text data or media, uh, and then the the third half thing is using using AI to to, to develop software that does all this stuff. Um, uh, and I, I guess the, the the part about extracting content is the most interesting to me. But we're but since we started off with uh, generating content, um, uh, maybe we should uh, stick with that. I mean, uh, there already have been tools even before this current AI explosion. There's something called Quicksilver, I think, that generated Wikipedia articles. Uh, does, I mean, does anybody know if if there already are, is content content on Wikipedia that's AI generated or anywhere else for that matter? Is that a phenomenon that's already happened? Uh, I've read a couple articles about it. Um, one of the, I, I can't think of them off the top of my head, uh, but uh, I remember just reading an article, I think it was in Tech Radar, um, and they were talking about, you know, mm -hmm. ChatGPT generated content on Wikipedia and a particular editor um, that they named in the article, so I'm sure you can look it up, um, had created uh, an article about art titling. And uh, it, we, that editor tagged it ChatGPT, so it'd be easy to find. And it, the draft was basically like, hey, this is initial edit. We put this in it's gonna have to be vastly improved right and so that sort of applied like uh cunningham's law ward cunningham uh which is like the best way to have you know a correct wikipedia article uh, is to write a bad wikipedia article mm -hmm. and then let the system take care of it um the amazing system that, that that creates all of the um highly trustable knowledge there so i think that uh that would sort of be my answer that yeah it is existing we don't know as much, and I think something that you said uh, there as well, like using ChatGPT to detect that, that's an interesting, that stuck in my head as you said that, because it would be interesting to know. I think that there's likely gonna need to be some type of tagging or other way that we can help facilitate humans understanding what's generative content versus what isn't, so that we don't end up in a sort of situation where content quality goes down as a whole because the volume of content coming in from the machines is so much greater um, at that point. So, yeah. Um, well, let's let's move on to. Uh, we'll probably come back to it, but to, to extracting content from Wikipedia, because um, Lane, I mean, you, you're in the a rare rare situation where that is is in directly or indirectly a, a big part of your job is is extracting content from Wikipedia and, and other Wikimedia sites. Uh, and if you're talking about, well, I'm I may be getting ahead of things, but if you're talking about smart speakers and so forth. Then that already is a AI powered in, in some sense. So this is something that's sort of been baked in from the beginning, I, maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, could you talk about that? You said the, 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 this potentially was a was a huge had it will have a huge impact on on what you do. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I think it's a safe assumption to make that like the full corpus of all the Wikimedia projects. Uh, including you know all, all the Wikipedia's and beyond is a, makes up a pretty a, a small because they're all small but significant chunk of the training data for most of the large language models that wow. exist, yeah. right? And so we, I mean, in a, business, in a business context, we're just sort of spending a lot of a lot of time thinking about that and sort of what it what it means for us, right? So and how do you? I, I mean, so when I say sort of it's and there are existential issues. I mean, I, I mean them larger than just sort of Wikimedia Enterprise. I mean, just for sort of like <laughs> Wikipedia generally, right? Like, uh, you know, we have a we we try to build towards a feedback loop where people get access to Wikipedia content, and then um, 
uh, some subset of those become really, really interested in it. Maybe they start with a couple of small edits. Maybe they become very, very invested in a particular topic area, right? The sort of virtuous cycle of like, how do we get new Wikipedia editors and how do we continue that growth? And the more that the content gets abstracted away from the more that the responses get abstracted away, right? All of all, all that all that content goes sort of into the corpus, gets munched up, abstracted, and then you know reproduced as like generative chat um, uh, or you know essay synopses or whatever whatever it might be. Um, that abstraction layer sort of takes people further and further away from that virtuous cycle of like what is like how do we get editors back into the mix. Right? That makes sense. So, like, where that abstraction, when I say it's sort of an existential challenge, one of the questions that we have is like, how, and th this is this is my sort of it's sort of my ba baseline answer to your question is like, um, where I, we're thinking about it right now is from more of this perspective of like for for the organization itself, like what is the relationship that we need to have to these sorts of things, um, and I feel like that's that's more the question that I I I have been focused on up until this point. I don't know, Matt, you might have a different answer. No, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. Like, and and, and to, to to be clear, like the questions around like like how do you get data out of wikis, or or, or what does that mean? Um, uh, you know, extraction of content from the wikis for the purposes of like training models and doing other things like that. I think the service that that Lane's group provides and and the level of access and performance and stuff makes makes a lot of sense for a lot of these you know big players trying to do these things. I think that um, to avoid that sick cycle, basically cyclical system, um, it all comes down to creating tools for editors and article creation. I think to get better data out of the system, um, you can use a lot of these these tools to like maybe compose it in unique ways. There's probably an opportunity there to sort of take a look at it and, and remap it and recompose it um, for different use cases. But I think ultimately um, to get more data in the system, I think it would be an interesting project to take a look at using some of these tools to understand articles that don't yet exist that mm. need to exist. Yeah. Um, how can you apply that type of you know artificial intelligence to better understand the gaps for things that aren't there? And you could even do that across wikis, for example, right? So we've got English Wikipedia, but there's other Wikipedias across the world. And I think that's a thing um, where I've even seen previous bots like a while back. There's been bots that do some of this stuff where they'll go through. Um, there's a an, an article. Uh, creator a while back that went and actually used like geo data to create you know basically a bunch of article stubs based on all the cities in the United States for example census data or whatever and that at least started the articles there I think there's probably way more advanced ways that we could do that which would help sort of avoid some of that really stuff that you're talking about yeah. what we have we have um what are your known unknowns I guess and that sounds like an interesting problem to solve with that technology I'll just add that um, without Wikipedia's monthly content dumps, without Lane's work, um, you know, training these AI models would be uh, would be much more difficult, and we would be years behind. So this work has been transformational in the entire world. I don't think that's an understatement to say. Um, so, uh, you know, Gunj and I both think that uh, there's not really any way to avoid you know using wikipedia's data uh, to kind of advance ai through its inputs um, does anyone know what squad is so it's uh, something it stands for create like a data set from wikipedia that is used for many seminal um, ai models so we can that it's purely like wikipedia articles from the english wikipedia so um, i'll just put it there because you know they've They've covered the rest, but just just know that it's it's been a huge influence. Yeah, yeah. The only thing that I would add to that that's interesting is, well, you know, one of the areas that we're also exploring is uh, one of the real one of the real values that you get out of like um, if you are a third party reuser, like a high volume reuser, like a search engine or a voice assistant or someone that needs to, one of the real values that you get out of using um, that. That you get from having real time access to changes in Wikipedia is that you know what's happening in the world, right? Like it's sort of the world's common knowledge store, right? Like how does, you know, you know, how does Bing know that Queen Elizabeth died? Odds are good that it was Wikipedia that told, you know, it was the editors. 
on that page on Wikipedia, making those changes very quickly and then not getting transmitted. There's whole, obviously a whole bunch of challenges in there. I talked about a few of those last year around like how do you determine credibility? But it's also really relevant in this space, right? Because there's a time gap between like when a large language model was trained and like what's happened in the world since then. So like one of the questions we're asking as an organization is like, what might we be able to do to help sort of fill in that gap, right? When people are uh, working in these environments or like using generative chats. Like that's one of the areas that we're interested in exploring is like, what's the value of real time access to our content in that environment? Another place we're thinking there are sort of more of a role for, uh, or starting to think again, this is all very exploratory, but starting to think that there's a role that um, the movement might play is in just the general issue of sort of like credibility, accuracy, verifiability, attribution, like that is a space where our communities are incredibly gifted, right? In terms of the way that they uh, think about and structure the creation of this information, the creation of this knowledge, um, and then sort of apply it in the world. And so one of the questions that I think we're also sort of standing back and asking like, is like, is there a role in that environment? Not, so now we're going sort of beyond the level of just like, like generation of information or generation of knowledge to these sort of broader issues like what, as these environments are starting to emerge, what are the other sort of meta issues that are going to arise and how might we be able to participate in those as well? I think those two are really particularly interesting, um, uh, real-time accuracy and credibility. And Gunjan would like to add that large language models, although you see that ChatGPT is air-gapped from the world and is stuck in 2021, it doesn't mean that all large language models, LLMs, are air-gapped like that. Because you can have real-time access LMs, barred, Google's terrible version of Bing AI does that. <laughs> Lambda and Palm, that's two Google models, they also do that. WebGPT, which powers uh, Bing Chat, does that too. And apparently the model that uh, my wiki's downloaded earlier today uh, could have done that too as well um, if, uh, if we picked those docs from the internet instead of the one that we you know, just kind of uh, uploaded and stored in there. And Lambda is just... Uh, slightly more sophisticated setup than what we had um but of course nowhere near chat gpt apparently so that's what benjamin says cool uh well i have well i have a lot more questions but i'll ask one one more question and then we'll uh, we'll turn to the audience but um uh, um i don't know if you, uh, how many of you remember but back uh back before web3 meant uh, you know uh, selling screenshots for like a million dollars um, <laughs> Web 3.0 referred to the semantic web, and uh, and that, that was sort of the the time semantic media wiki got started really in in that spirit uh, around 2005, um, and then semantic media wiki begat cargo and uh, and wiki data in in different ways, uh, and then indirectly begat uh, abstract Wikipedia as well. Uh, but there was that whole idea of putting structured creating structure out of all this data. Um, but now that this whole approach with with AI based uh, LLMs or whatever is it's purely text based and and they can they can do so much more with text than than we than than they could before than we really imagined. Uh, so is there still a place uh, for is there is there a place for for that kind of structured queryable data within this whole world or is that just sort of, sort of becoming uh, irrelevant? A structured query will data for what? Anything. For AI. Anything. I'd like to ask an AI model a structured query will data? No, no we'll ask, just, a, uh, ask an AI a general question and have it use uh, queryable data from Wikidata or, or anybody, any other wiki as opposed to just doing its sheer text uh, uh, munging, whatever you want to call it. So sort of like, is there any point to knowledge graphs at all in this future world that we're moving into? Sure, yes. Oh, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, no, no. <laughs> uh, so it can help, but it would require a multimodal model, one that incorporates text, structured data, and graphs. Very good. Well, the the, the question was longer than the answer there. So. Well, I mean, I'm still typing. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, uh, well, no. well, in your world, does that come up at all as far as uh, as, as far as Wikidata or abstract Wikipedia? Maybe abstract Wikipedia in a different way, but um, that whole I, idea. I mean, it comes up for us certainly on the enterprise front because you know largely what enterprise has built in the way that like Wikimedia um, content has been used up 
until relatively recently was to populate knowledge graphs, right? So that's how it would work. A large search engine, like say a Bing, would you know maintain a pipeline to all of our content. They'd get it in dumps. They'd get it in a fire hose. They get it in one-off article queries. Every sort of search engine maintained a slightly different relationship with our services, but they'd all come up with some sort of equilibrium. And it was all about just sort of like filling in, like filling, putting all of our content into their knowledge graph along with, you know, other smaller data sources to build sort of one big knowledge set that they would then repurpose in a variety of environments like search engines and voice assistants. And I do think that is changing, although I know I know that it's changing because I can see it changing. I don't know that it is entirely clear exactly how that's going to shake out and like what the balance is going to be between like what's used for sort of where traditional knowledge graphs are used and where that sort of structured content is valuable versus where it's going to get, let's say, eaten up by large language models. I think we'll have some sort of new equilibrium there. I don't know that anybody knows what it looks like quite yet, ourselves included. I, I can say that we're still very invested in figuring out how to make the data that comes through our pipes more machine readable in ways that like Wikipedia data has not historically been, um, because we still think that it's going to have value. But I do think that the, the calculus of what that value is is changing. I'm just like to, yeah, he said, um, research has been done on this, but there are zero open source ones right now. Hopefully in a year or two, we'll see some, but I, I would personally, Jeffrey would like to suggest you change you wish to see. There you go. Uh, okay, do we, do we have any questions uh, on the answer? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, earlier you mentioned using ChatGPT and other tools to detect their own uses. But I've seen firsthand it'll it can also say, hey, this was written by ChatGPT when it was written by a human. Like I saw it being written. To what extent would adding tools that flag articles as, oh, this was written by a bot, be problematic when you can't verify false bot? Like you can't. If someone says no, this was written by me, there's no way to actually verify that with anonymous editors. Yeah, it's a question about uh, overly aggressive uh, flagging of uh, of uh, bot written uh, or AI written, not really text. Yeah, and I mean, I, I can I can attempt to take that one. It's like you're you're sort of talking about like a a large edge case, like and it can be larger and larger. Maybe it does it fine sometimes, but how do you how can you tell when it's doing it fine and it's not doing it other times in terms of identifying content written by itself or something similar to itself? And then that's not the only one that people are using. There's other ones there too. So yeah, okay, cool. We're chat GPT focused and it's just that. Well, what about you know any of the other ones, the large language models that people are also using? I think that if you know that it's um, unavoidable, the content will be created using this tool. Sounds like that's, that's the case. What would be the smart play would be to create article creation and or editor tools to bring that close and and make a path of least resistance while doing so that enable you to label and tag those articles such that it, it there is no advantage to a person creating an article to go and like copy and paste and do all their own stuff and whatever their text editor of choice is and then pump it in versus just you know have the edit interface there or being able to create an article and have some sort of search extension or plugin or availability that they can do some of that work right with when where they already are so then you can label and tag that article at the start. You're still not going to fix it. Like it's still going to be, but at least you'd be in a better state than if um, if you did nothing. So I think I think um, we're looking for uh, better, not best, in terms of what we're going to get there. And that's probably as good as we're going to get. Um, and you do that by uh, helping smooth the path. Um, uh, so first, something for me, um, you know, this is ultimately, it's just a problem that is persistent everywhere. You know, every single thing like this is going to have false positives and false negatives. Trying to solve that is impossible, right? If we have, we could, if we could solve that, then we wouldn't be putting innocent people in jail, right? We wouldn't have juries. We would just have, you know, whatever, you know, right or wrong, we just get it right every single time. We don't. Um, so being a pragmatist myself, I, I don't even want to consider like being perfect. It's not the question here. It's that how do we try to minimize it? And this is where Gunjin's uh, response comes in. 
Um, he says that the real danger may be that humans add ChatGPT content to their submissions, which require a model to verify paragraph by paragraph or maybe sentence by sentence. So, you know, this verification system is definitely buildable, but would take longer. And for whatever reason, research has not tackled this yet, but he imagines that this can be done relatively simply with some additional engineering work. Uh, Rich? Okay. Um, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping to sort of tease out what my question is. Um, a lot of conversation, if I understand right, is with the assumption that you're using MediaWiki in, in, in an encyclopedic application. Um, however, that's not the only way that MediaWiki can be used. Um, those of us that are semantic MediaWiki users uh, talk, or at least uh, what, what I've been advertising in, in my world, is that we're using uh, MediaWiki with semantic MediaWiki as a, as a knowledge graph node editor. So we're, we're crafting the ontologies that we want our organization to deal with. And in doing so, we are, we are implementing the structure that we know about, the knowledge that we know about. Um, and one of the things that, that I learned in the past year or two is that when you take the basic semantic triple building block and you, and you create a more complicated ontology with it, uh, you model a concept with a variety of properties. And, that, and so then that node in the network is guaranteed to have a particular uh, footprint in the knowledge graph. Um, that's called a facet. And so the facets that we program explicitly is the data that we can knowingly pull out. But one of the things that we're still very excited to do and hoping that machine learning and artificial intelligence can help with is to identify the facets that are implicit in the knowledge graph that we didn't uh, program intentionally, but it's the things we, the, the knowledge in the graph that we don't know is there that we need something like AI to find for us. Mm -hmm. So that would be the implicit knowledge. So um, if we program the system so that we're uh, entering new nodes and curating the nodes, uh, there's an, an emergent, there, there are things to be learned from the knowledge graph mm -hmm. that we don't even know are there. And we're excited about applying machine learning and AI to finding that. And so as we discuss, the interface between, um, well, as this is an enterprise media wiki conference, um, my hope is that when we look at the you know, media wiki is a tool that was created by the foundation for, for their goals. And it works beautifully for their goals and it continues to work beautifully for their goals. But the existence of the enterprise community is a testimony to the idea that 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 tool can be applied to other problems, and uh, and the in the introduction of AI into into the industry, right, will most likely help the foundation differently than it will help enterprise users, and um, and so I really perked up when when you said that there's a possibility that AI will render knowledge graphs uh, obsolete, and oh. I actually don't think that's true. Um, okay. I, was, I, was, I, was, I, was just, I was just trying to describe the stipulation that was sure. Uh, okay. What it's worth, but yes. Yeah, yeah, but but it's a fascinating topic that uh, that that knowledge graphs could become you know uh, overtaken by just uh, text processing AI, and um, but I I do believe that there will always be a need uh, to not creatively establish structured data, but that organizations, enterprise organizations, will always have a need to control the type of structure that they want, the, you know, to establish the structure. Um, and then there's this, uh, then, then there's things that the humans can't do, which we will, we were just waiting for AI tools to help us with. So um, I guess maybe to sort of land, uh, to land is to simply say that uh, in addition to how can AI help the encyclopedic application of MediaWiki, uh, please don't 
uh, ignore the enterprise applications that are that 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 use MediaWiki as a foundation for not so much encyclopedia articles, but for organizational knowledge um, that is maybe a, a more more business oriented and less encyclopedia oriented. Yeah, I will. I will say what I'm struck by and what you're saying. Um, Wait, sorry. I will, will oh. just. I don't know if I can repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good luck. Take oh, what, coming. Okay. Take it was coming. Okay. It was. It was. It was uh, fine. Go ahead. It, it, everyone heard. It. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll be quick. I just want to say what I'm struck by and what you're saying is that I feel like it is sort of a uh, yes, and like it is another sort of uh, variant or application of this concept of like how might we take these tools to make the. So how might we use this in a sort of a, in a way that augments human capability? I 100% agree with you. In fact, that was where my comment was coming from, that there is going always inside businesses, there's going to be a desire to have some level of sort of hu human managed control over their information environment. Right. Um, and so looking for ways, and I do think this is a huge opportunity in the media wiki space generally, looking for ways to, whether it's you know tied to the foundation or not, looking for ways to build tools that support that kind of, uh, to sort of take take as the sort of a baseline value that this isn't about replacing people, it's about augmenting people. Right. Starting with that as sort of a fundamental precept and then figuring out what sorts of tools and what sorts of abilities you can grant people, I think would be a pretty significant, almost differentiating factor in the market. Okay. Um, I have a I have some, some of my own thoughts and Gunjan has some thoughts too. Um, in some ways, OpenAI kind of subsidizes Wikipedia, right? Because it trains on so much data from it, and it's its own base model. So um, I feel like it's kind of a search engine for Wikipedia myself. But the good news is, Rich, that um, it is still possible for us to build on the shoulders of giants. And even small wikis should be able to benefit from this. The way you do it is. Um, you just take a model that's already trained, like a GPT clone. There's actually quite a few open source GPT uh, alternatives out there, especially if you like look on Hugging Face. Um, you can take that and then fine tune it up a little bit on your limited articles. So um, it'll get a little better on the stuff that you want it to be on. Um, so that's like, like what you just demoed, no? Today? Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. So it's possible, so don't worry, okay. yeah. Uh, well, or what, what the other the other Jeffrey demoed. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess what I would like to say is that I believe that the future is bright, and that uh, that the AI is not going to render all the projects that we've been working on irrelevant. I think it's going to supercharge them in ways that you know there's there's going to be a, a really exciting renaissance of hopefully um, wiki based solutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, very briefly, what did you mean by AI, open AI subsidizing Wikipedia? This is my personal opinion, and um, it's because uh, GPT is trained on a lot of data sources, including Wikipedia itself, right? Okay. I mean, it's not like a literal subsidization, like by money. I'm talking about like you know, um, if you want to search Wikipedia, you can just kind of use ChatGPT, and it'll synthesize a lot of the information from Wikipedia itself. Will it? literally return you the wikipedia articles no but you know it well yeah okay no, no yeah i mean so, some people in the community actually would say that it's the opposite it's so it's uh i think it's, it's leeching a, off of wikipedia it, yeah yeah i think it's don't get me wrong i agree with that as well i think it's um i think it's like a two-way street here you know what i mean because okay. my personal opinion this has nothing to do with, with, with what gunjan says so it's probably gonna be stupider than what he says is that um we could probably use ChatGPT eventually to kind of be like a chat bot for Wikipedia, right? So instead of using Sierra Search, you could just use, you could just type it in, say like, hey, based on what Wikipedia says, can you find me this specific passage or something like that? And you can even synthesize for multiple articles, right? So the, the yeah, the future is bright. The future is bright. It's a, it's a mutual relationship, I think. Yes, there is definitely a lot of leeching, but that's what happens when you make the articles, you know, Creative Commons license. Well, sure. yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, just, well, just br briefly again, uh, I, that's not my personal opinion. I just remember that was the big subject when uh, uh, the big view, when the Google knowledge graph came out however long ago that, you know, now there's, now that people could see the data somewhere other than Wikipedia, then it was gonna, 
<laughs> ruin everything. But anyway, uh, oh, yeah. sorry, Lane, did you want to jump in and say something before we get to the question? Oh, no, I mean, I absolutely, there are really interesting thoughts about, there was an engineer uh, about sort of like uh, tra transformation in this context too, because it's not just about being able to return the article, it's about being able to sort of see the information in new and different ways. There was an engineer at, there's an article, they, they wrote this up, so it's on, on the web somewhere, um, but there was an engineer at the foundation who was exploring, uh, basically like, you know, it, it would be, I, I often find this when I'm talking to educational companies, it would be very useful if we could return Wikipedia articles, not as flat articles, but as Q and A's, you know? Give me all the questions and all the answers that you could potentially extract out of this page that could be used in an educational context, right? Or even sort of tuning those questions in different ways. And I have done a lot of playing with ChatGPT and like what it might be able to do to transform a Wikipedia page into a question and answer environment. It's quite, quite good at it, actually. There was a really interesting exploration of like, how might we use that as the base, again, with a sort of a human in the loop model, how might we use that as the basis of a way for being able to semi-automatically with sort of validation, um, tra transform some of these pages in ways that were potentially useful. So it's just, I think it's just the beginning of kind of, beginning to ask those questions. So I wanna say like, I, I hear the subsidization, I agree with the two-way street aspect. I have an additional concern about the longevity of the projects in that environment, because again, there's that abstraction layer that that breaks the loop, right? The editor loop. Although I think there might be other ways to address that. Plenty of other ways. We're very early days of starting to think that through that problem. Um, but uh, but I am most intrigued by this idea that like in in some ways, like right now, the information on a Wikipedia page is trapped in a single format. You know, it's like trapped in a single format. And I think about this a lot when we're dealing with like sort of third party content reuse, because in some ways it's freeing that information uh, to be used in other ways. And so I look at AI as an opportunity to potentially turbocharge that as well, right? If the mission of an organization or a foundation is to get this information into as the sort of minds of as many people as possible, then the ability to take a single context and abstract that into multiple contexts is really potentially quite sort of liberating for, you know, information, humanity, what have you. I like that. Yeah. And Gunjan tells me that if you want to be limited to Wikipedia for like a, you know, chat model, then you can just create a chat GT cell model that's only trained on it. And I think for Wikipedia specifically, because it's the world's largest wiki, there should be a justification enough to train like an actual model that's not just fine-tuned on it, but actually trained on Wikipedia solely, as opposed to chat GPT, which is trained on so many other things. Um, I would personally encourage maybe the Wikimedia Foundation to look into finding ways to either do it themselves or encourage the development of an open source model that's trained on Wikipedia. Yeah, that could definitely be. Uh, that, yeah, that could definitely be neat and open up the possibility of a, a chatbot within Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, James. So I think as we get into this territory of <clears throat> auto-generated uh, paragraphs, one thing that's going to be very interesting is the idea of factual provenance. That when a fact, when a factual statement is written down, the machine will know where that thing came from. And I think Wikipedia is in a good position to put together a provenance data set since it does a decent job of putting the source right next to the thing being cited. And so what I'm wondering is what the Wikimedia Enterprise has put into putting together a provenance data set. Has there been, a, has there been and if I can uh, rephrase or uh, summarize that, has there, has there been any effort to, to try to create a, a provenance data set or a provenance <clears throat> locator or something? For there's some way to say, like, you know, here's a sentence, here's where it came from, and here's what that source actually is. Yeah. Um, I mean, not specifically in that direction. We are spending a lot of time trying to figure out just how to sort of like break up the page mm -hmm. into different pieces. And obviously citations are a very large part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking about like how citations re relate to the page and how we might sort of connect those together in ways that were more machine readable. But that's, that's sort of to the extent that we have wandered. I hear what you're saying, which is a much more robust approach to something like that. So mm -hmm. I would say we haven't gone that far down the path. We're still we're still in very much baby steps land on that front. Thank you. Right. All right. Is there any other questions? Is there anyone on uh, online who? Okay. Um, well, there's so much we can talk about. Uh... <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Right. Sorry. What Jeffrey was talking about about. Uh, 
training something on uh, Wikipedia, right? We're in the enterprise media wiki conference about you know, largely uh, groups or organizations or companies that capture their own knowledge. And that is a siloed bit of knowledge that has good reasons not to be shared with the open world, right? Um, and uh, I wonder if anybody has thoughts about, you know, applying AI and this well-structured, sometimes very well-structured with some Wikipedia wiki or cargo or something else, uh, data uh, for use with AI to create internal, uh, you know, chatbots or uh, ways to better access the knowledge, kind of what we're just talking about. And also something that Rich talked about that I never really thought about, a way to reflect on itself and find, uh, you know, um, inconsistencies in your own data um, that represent your company's knowledge. Um, yeah, just briefly, another question about about having uh, AIs or formerly known as LLMs incorporate actual uh, structured data and and further enhance it, I guess, as opposed to just dealing with text. So to just to on, on the context front, like so, if you think about an internal or an enterprise MediaWiki implementation that has a lot of knowledge in there, um, in a in a previous position. Um, that I was in as well. It was actually in, in the knowledge management space. Um, and one of the things that was the most useful to a particular individual at an enterprise, which is a swath of people all trying to work together towards a mission, uh, and they needed knowledge, and, and knowledge management is one of the fundamental goals, right, of, of being able to find what you're looking for. And it connects the person trying to solve the problem to either the information that helps them learn about what problem they're trying to solve or the other expert in the organization that has the things that they need to know in order to solve it. And I think that for that reason, right, knowledge management and being able to find the experts or find the content or find the information that you're looking for in a very quick, easy to understand and easily consumable way is like secret sauce, right? And so I think that when you look at the way AI can build a context around some of the things and some of the questions that you can ask something like ChatGPT now. Um, back in the day, um, I still remember when like natural language queries and stuff like that were supposed to be great. Um, and you would start doing some of that work and they weren't quite working right. And now we fast forward to today and it's like, wow, like I can't believe it actually gave you that answer. I think there's a lot of opportunity there um, to have some type of plugin or an extension or, or leverage that against internal data sets to be able to connect people to what they're looking to do. And I would say, I'll go one step further to say, you could probably do some really cool things to help guide shape the path. Again, I used that term before in one of my other answers, but that's often the thing. Sometimes people don't know what they're even looking for. They might know a particular part of a problem or something else. So I think that's where beautiful design or UI or helping lead a person down one particular pathway of multiple, um, you can use that combined with you know, the AI tools like that, and then your your internal data set to really do some magical things within an organization. Yeah, I was thinking the other day about um, uh, how, how, valuable, uh, how valuable it could be at, internally inside an organization, just for sort of like the rudimentaries of, you know, like creating an agenda for a meeting. It'd be amazing if it was, you know, sort of tied into your email and everybody else's email. And or summarizing. Right, or summarizing after the fact, or summarizing during. You know, it would be really nice if it was a tool that was just sort of keeping a list of action items for me as we were, as we were interacting, right? And all the pieces are there to make something like that happen. So I will be really interested to see what kinds of tools we get to sort of operate in that way, particularly inside the enterprise. Because there are some things I would love to have for most meetings, like an agenda that I can guarantee you I will never put together. I keep booking meetings with them without an agenda. It's true. Yeah. About. Hey. What are you talking about? It'd be so nice if something else sort of used what had already been created to put that in front of us. Quick, quick question, actually. Um, has Wikimedia Enterprise been the one that's responsible for getting this you know, huge data sets out to like OpenAI? Uh, actually, no. For the most part, the sort of the paid experience and the what we call our paid APIs and the free APIs mm -hmm. are, I mean, they operate very similarly, but right. like the enterprise team is not actually responsible for maintaining the, for the most part, it's the free dumps yeah. that are used. Okay, I see. Um, gotcha. And we actually, I shouldn't say we are, we are responsible for part of what goes into those dumps, Yeah. Um, but we are not actually responsible for maintaining them, but that's just sort of a semantic distinction between different parts of the org. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And so what I've been told to say is I think, yeah, Gunjan says that people like you are the godfathers of NLP. Yeah, I mean, not me at all, because <laughs> I'm literally just the plumber here. Yeah. <laughs> but um, who, who 
who's the one who maintains the the monthly dumps? Uh, Ariel Glenn. Yes, yeah. yes, I think Ariel. Um, yeah, culture, I think. yeah, Ariel yeah. is amazing, and yeah. uh, and actually that that product, the dumps product itself, exists within the platform engineering group, which is the group that I have the pleasure of yep. uh, uh, working for. Yep. Um, and uh, within platform engineering, right, dumps as a product, and even the evolution of dumps, and continuing to make sure we maintain service, to make sure it's in the right mirror, some of the other things like that. We're actually we're we're looking at that. We've got a team set up with a couple people now um, helping Ariel as well and then we're taking a look at you know what would we need to do for like dumps 2.0 right what things does it do really well right now and how can we evolve the things that the world needs from it uh, as a product and some of that is is native to the dumps functionality and all the revisions and everything else that it puts out there um, but the other parts of it is actually inspired by the work that Wikimedia Enterprise is doing in terms of the type and shape of some of the content that's being delivered and the ways that they're doing that um, so yeah, and then in and amongst all of that, we've also got uh, an API platform team uh, as well that's trying to look holistically at the APIs provided to access data and taking a look at and thinking about how do we want to evolve that platform uh, overall. We have a couple of people in this room that have a hand in that right now and know far more about it than I do. Yeah. Um, so it's been great. Yeah. So it's no exaggeration to say that Ariel has been instrumental, you know, yep. in in the work that's been done to uh, make this possible. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, at, uh, uh, when you have yeah, to. Uh, I, I do have to run. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think this is a good time to end it. We've covered a lot of stuff and, uh, and uh, learned a few things. Uh, so, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you, everybody. Thank you.